What's up, everybody? Andrew Mahone here with Tricky Jim at Full Grip Games. Going to be presenting the League Challenge at Full Grip here for you all tonight. We've got an exciting matchup here for round one. Brady Botner on the left with his Vileplume Regigigas Stall Deck against Cody Gray with his Stunfisk deck. Cody is a Stunfisk aficionado. He has played Stunfisk at many tournaments so far, and it's one of his favorite decks to play. I think he's scored over 50 championship points with Stunfisk so far. So definitely comfortable with the deck. Looks like he also plays Tapu Koko in order to spread damage on the opponent's side of the field. But Brady is coming to the table with a Vileplume stall deck. Vileplume has an ability, Disgusting Pollen, which reads, as long as this Pokemon is your active Pokemon, your opponent's basic Pokemon cannot attack. That could be absolutely devastating for Cody's deck, which I'm not sure actually plays too many non-basic Pokemon. So this could be a tight matchup we sure, uh, for sure. We do see that Cody does play Zeb Strika. So worse comes to worse, Cody could get in there and start attacking with Zeb Strika, though. Zeb Strika only does a base 60 damage. Cody does play Electro Power, which should allow him to boost his Pokemon's damage output. I'm also not sure whether Cody plays any way to disrupt Brady's hand. We'll have to see how substantial Brady's hand here looks after his opening play. It looks like he's going to start off strong here, though with two Oddish, and then we already saw that he does have a Vileplume in his hand as well. So if he's got Rare Candy, he's going to be able to get a turn two, uh, turn two Vileplume, which would be very tough. And Brady's going right in with the Mars here, discarding a counter energy from Cody's side of the field. That is good for sure because every energy that he can eliminate from Cody's deck means less opportunities for Cody to attack overall. Cody's gonna start off here with a Ultra Ball, discarding another counter energy. Cody actually doesn't seem to mind discarding these counter energies. He says, you know what? Looks like I'm playing against a stall deck and he could probably bet that Brady is not going to be taking any prizes throughout the course of the game. And with no prizes taken, counter energy will not ever come into effect. It will only get to count as a single colorless energy throughout the game, which is probably not what Brady is looking for, or not what Cody is looking for. Cody's gonna go grab a Tapu Coco promo. The Tapu Coco promo was will be good for that flying flip attack, however, if Brady has a rare candy, it's not going to be able to attack at all. So Cody may have to pivot to attacking with Zeb Strika here, which would definitely be a interesting turn of events. See, Cody does get a big turn one Lily draw, and it's gonna fill up to a hand of eight as he proceeds with his turn have to imagine Cody would probably be excited to knock out this Oddish turn one if he could. So if he can get an Electro Power, I believe that the Oddish only has 50 hit points. I'm going to have to check that real quick, but think that this Oddish, yes, only has 50 hit points. So one Electro Power would do it. Or Zapdos, sure enough. Cody does find the Thunder Mountain Prism Star, which means that he's going to be able to pivot into Zapdos. And we see Cody casually going for a second Blitzel here. Looks like he plays a thick Zeb Strike Align, probably a 2 2 Zeb Strike Align, which means that he has multiple options to damage this Violet Plume with the possibility of two Zeb Strike in deck. We see he does have Lightning Energy in his hand. And I. Looks like he's going to pass. He actually does not have a switch card. He just has to hit with the Blitzel for 10 damage. I believe the attack name is Flop on the Blitzel. So Breedy does have Enhanced Hammer. It's going to remove that double colorless from the bench Tapu Koko. And no way 
has the rare candy violet plume in his hand without even having to use Steven's Resolve. That is wild. This deck does not play too many copies of rare candy. I think it might only play two copies of rare candy, and the deck only plays two copies of Violet Plume. A turn two Violet Plume is not something that this deck gets very often. So Brady obtaining the turn two Violet Plume here against Cody's Field of Basics is very strong. And Brady also has a counter to that Thunder Mountain Prism Star Stadium, which means that Cody's not going to be able to attack with the Zeb Strika for just one energy. And folks, this could be a wrap for Cody. Disgusting Pollen just proving to be an absolute force. Brady opts not to counter the Thunder Mountain Prism Star yet. And it looks like Cody's actually suiting up his Zapdos in the face of this Violet Plume. He's going to use Guzma, switch into his Zapdos, and take out the second Oddish. I mean, that threat removed from play is great. Cody also gripping a couple Electro Powers in his hand. It looks like he doesn't actually have too much else. Though, the Zapdos being on the bench does concern me, or being in play does concern me, because it's got a retreat cost of two. So Brady should be able to more or less strand this Zapdos in the active position for pretty much the remainder of the game. I don't think there's any other target that Brady would rather have in the active position right now than this Zapdos just sitting there, unable to attack because of Violet Plume's disgusting pollen. I think Brady just needs to start kind of working on his hand size, using cards like Steven's Resolve, uh, just getting a larger hand, and hoping that Cody doesn't really have a way to disrupt it. Looks like Brady's considering a play, though. Uh, he actually is going to opt to counter the stadium. I like that. He can heal the 10 damage off of the Violet Plume and probably just pass until he gets a Steven's Resolve in his hand. Sure enough, he's got one. So he's going to be able to add three cards from his deck to his hand while Cody is in a severely compromising situation. The healing from that stadium also means that Cody's 60 damage that he's going to be doing with Zeb Strika is going to get healed off almost every turn from that life forest. So Cody definitely in a pretty rough spot here. And we see that his hand is not actually fantastic as well. He's got a Guzma and a couple Electro Powers. And unless Brady benches another Pokemon, Cody's not going to be able to play that Guzma to move the Zapdos out of the active here. Brady is considering the other two cards to select. And it's interesting the routes that he can take. He probably wants to grab himself a Regigigas just in case things start to look kind of uh, kind of sketchy and he wants to put down another basic Pokemon. He can probably grab uh, another Stevens. You already know that he's going to want to Stevens again the following turn. And then maybe a disruption card like Plumeria or a heal card just in case Cody starts to suit up one of these Abstrikas on his bench. So I think I would, I would like to see Plumeria probably... A, another basic Pokemon and another Stevens are the cards that Brady should probably grab here. You're just going to have to keep removing the energy from Cody's Blitzel as he attaches them. But sure enough, Cody has got a fat nothing and is just going to pass. So Brady uh, draws his card for a turn. Cody's got nothing, nothing off the top deck. Brady's eyeing up his discard pile here, trying to figure out how to proceed. And sure enough, it looks like Brady did opt for another fat Pokemon, but instead of Regigigas, decided to get a Magikarp and Waylord Tag Team GX. I don't mind that. The Magikarp and Waylord is going to be tough for Cody to take down. I just worry that potentially Cody plays some Shrine of Punishments or things like that that could eventually wear away at the Magikarp and Wailord's hit points. But honestly, I don't think that Cody's deck 
has a big attacker that can actually deal with Magikarp and Waylord's 300 HP. Now, Cody's in a tough spot here. He doesn't actually want to discard all of these resources in his hand, but he did top deck a Zebstrika. So, I think he kind of has to grip these for another turn. He's got Electro Power, Electro Charger, but it looks like he's actually looking to move. He's going to promote the Tapu Koko here and try to apply some pressure. He's going to Electro Power, Electro Charger, see if he can get these Electro Powers back into his, uh, his deck. He's got one. One going back into the deck, so I don't mind this. He's just going to burn his hand down and then sprint for four cards, flying flip for a bunch of damage here. Actually getting to soften up the Violet Plume as well. So things aren't looking absolutely horrible for Cody here. That being said, Brady has got a gigantic hand. You have to imagine that he's got plenty of options to glance off this hit here after Cody dishes it out. And there he goes with the sprint, discarding another Guzma. Feels tough because the Guzmas are his number one form of mobility in this matchup. And I think Cody is down three Guzmas so far. Looks like he's just going to flying flip. He gets an extra 10 damage because of Shrine and bumps that life forest. Brady's going to take this opportunity to Gladian. Potentially is missing a piece that he feels like he needs for this match. And it looks like he grabs it right away. There's no consideration there. Brady already knows the piece that he wanted off that Gladian is going to fish it out right away. And he's got Rescue Stretcher. Brady actually looking to get potentially a second Vala Plume into play. Maybe <laughs> he's got three Oddish. So it looks like he is definitely gearing up for another Oddish. And thank you so much, Brian, for the bits. Says, good evening. Getting super excited to be in Daytona. Hope everyone there has fun regardless of gameplay. Excellent spirit there, Brian. Thank you so much for the bits. Good luck to everybody who is traveling to Daytona this weekend. And thank you so much for the support there, Brian, as always. Looks like Cody is just going to fly and flip again. Brady's got that Magikarp and Waylord out in the active position still. Soaking hits, and I have to wonder whether or not Brady's got some heal options. I suspect that he does. You just don't want to heal the Magikarp and Waylord too preemptively. And with the second Violet Plume coming into play, Cody's got to be feeling that pressure there. Especially with Acerola, it looks like Brady is just going to Acerola that Magikarp and Waylord promote a second Violet Plume, and now the Tapu Kokos cannot attack. We see that Cody is wising up to the situation, though, has suited up a Zebstrika on his bench with a Lightning Energy, and we could see an attack from this Zebstrika this turn. That's what it's looking like. Head Bolt deals 60 damage, and with the Electro Chargers, we know that Cody does have the option to throw some of those powerful Electro Powers back into the deck. Brady has Max Potion ready to go and will Lusamine, meaning that he's going to be able to get a supporter back to his hand, two supporters. He's going to grab Steven's Resolve and Ace Arola there. Brady needs to find himself Plumeria. As I said this earlier, I think that Plumeria is going to be his best friend. He needs to be able to remove the energy from this Zebstrika to eliminate some of the pressure that Headbolt is applying to the field. And we see Cody is just very calmly just using Headbolt turn after turn, trying to bide his time here. Brady needs to Stevens resolve for a couple of things. I think he really wants to find a counter catcher and then also needs to find a Plumeria. Countercatcher can just drag up the Zapdos turn after turn. He kind of wants to have that thing in the active position at all times, I think. And I think it is correct to Stevens here, though. Brady is feeling the pressure with 60 damage on it. 
Violet Bloom does get KO'd by a headbolt with an Electro Power. And Brady's going to check Cody's discard pile real quick, make sure there's nothing he is missing out on. And keep in mind, folks, this is a 30-minute plus three format meaning that if these players go to time, could very well end in a tie if there is no conclusive winner. We see there Cody also has Let Loose Marshadow in his hand. I think at this point, Cody wants to save that Let Loose until potentially after um, Brady uses one more Stevens, though I will say at this point, Brady's hand is large enough that a Let Loose could be a great play. I just worry that Cody might be running too low on switch cards to be able to finish this game out. Brady's going to be able to drag up that Zapdos pretty often between Guzmas and counter catchers. There's lots of options to do that. It looks like Cody is going to go in here playing Electro Power and will let loose. Have to imagine that this is probably Cody's only option to disrupt Brady's hand throughout the course of the game. So this is it, folks. Uh, Cody is looking to capitalize on this let loose here, and make it so that make it so that uh, Brady draws pretty poorly here. That would be his end goal. With only four cards, Brady is a far cry from the powerful hand that he had previously. It looks like Cody does rip the energy there. Very powerful. And can Lily, Lily filling his hand up to six? He's going to be able to retreat this Zapdos, but I have a feeling this isn't the last time we're going to see the Zapdos in the active position. The Electro Power, this Zepstrika is dealing 90 damage. And is that not an 130 hit points? How many hit points does the Vile Plume have? Thought it was 130, but I guess I am mistaken. So Vile Plume. Vile Plume has what, 150? 140. 10 short. And Brady grips the counter catcher, bringing up Zapdos. And sure enough, Cody is stuck trying to find a way to get that Zapdos back out of the active position. Fortunately for Cody, he does have double colorless energy which can just pivot that Zapdos out of the active position easily. So that is actually a fantastic thing that Cody has going for him. And I think that Brady might not see that coming, but Cody can just, oh, he also plays a skate rope. So Cody intelligently saves the double colorless. It's going to escape rope here. And I think... I, will, I really actually, I want to see, yeah, Cody take the knockout. So 90 plus 60, that's going to be it. And now Brady is in an extremely compromising situation. He's got a foul plume with only 10 hit points left, and he didn't Stevens last turn. He needs another basic, but there's a Regigigas. He does have Oddish in his hand as well that we know he ace a roller, but Oddish does not have a lot of hit points. It's going to be really tough for Brady to tank with. The Regigigas is exactly what he needed here. And we see Brady opting to Plumeria. Going to get rid of the double colorless energy. I actually disagree with that. I think that lightning is much more valuable. So I think, well, I also have the benefit of knowing Brady's hand, but I think that, uh, or knowing Cody's hand, I think that the lightning is more valuable since it is required in order to use the attack where the double call is not actually required there. We see Cody just opt to attach that DCE and it's going to be knocking out this Vile Plume this turn with Headbolt. So Zeb Strike up putting in a lot of work in this matchup as Cody cruises on down to three prizes remaining and Brady just has to pass. He doesn't have it. Cody, playing Electro Charger, gets to shuffle two Electro Powers back into the deck that is absolutely huge. The recycling of these Electro Powers has been 
significant in this matchup. Cody's deck is just not running out of juice whatsoever. Usually that is the major fault of these lightning decks against the stall decks is that they only have so many ways to boost their damage output throughout the course of the game. But Cody seemingly just never runs out of gas. He just has all of these electro powers. See, he's got one in his hand now. He could go full greed mode, play the electro power, and go for, what, do we need four electro powers to knock this thing out to deal 200 damage? I don't think it's worth it. I think Cody kind of just has to go for the two-hit KO here. Um, it looks like he might be setting up a second Zip Striker, though, and he is. So he's got the option to go for a big dig turn if he wants to. I just don't think that that's the most responsible play. Brady only has a two-card hand right now. We know that one of those cards, uh, I think, is... No, he discarded the Oddish, so I'm not actually sure. I think one of them Stevens. But if one of those cards is not a heal card, Brady could be in a lot of trouble. I think I do see a Rescue Stretcher potentially in his hand, though, which would be good and could give him another turn. Looks like Cody's playing his hand down, though. He might be going for the sprint play. That is super aggressive. He needs four Electro Powers to knock this thing out this turn. And it looks like Cody is just going to Cynthia. Electro Power and Cynthia. Cody could be going for it here. He needs all four Electro Powers to take the knockout on this Regigigas. That would be absolutely stunning if he is able to pull this off. I don't necessarily trust that a deck under my control in my hands could do it but Cody knows his deck knows what it is capable of and is uh going for broke here against the 180 hit point Regigigas I think Zapdos deals 80 80 plus 90 with three would be 10 short Zapdos needs all four yep they both need four so he's just going to end up doing 90 damage it's a two hit ko so not bad sure enough brady has got a whale so exactly what brady needs to buy a little bit more time cody should be able to take this knockout though with a probably actually he just needs another electro power really unfortunate he's got one in his hand now but he doesn't want to waste too many resources he does get the knockout and Brady's Waylord taking some residual damage there from the Shrine of Punishment against this Zeb Strikeout. Brady's still not able to solidify his hand yet. He's kind of been in a real drought situation since the let loose on Cody's side of the field. And Brady just passes here. He does know that Cody is probably running low on Electro Powers at this point. He's just going to continue using Headbolt. Knows that Zapdos is good for 110 damage with the Choice Band equipped. Brady's going to take this opportunity to count out how many cards are actually left in Cody's deck. Looks like Brady's going to opt to Rescue Stretcher here. Grabbing the Regigigas, I really like that. I think pivoting between the... Waylord and Regigigas is probably the best bet here. Don't necessarily think that Brady needed to bench that Magikarp Waylord quite yet. He could have maybe gone another turn, though perhaps he was scared of the amount of Electro Chargers that could be in Cody's deck. Cody just has to swing into the Regigigas. Now it looks like this Regigigas is probably not going to be a significant prize since Brady will probably try to tank out with this Magikarp Waylord for the remainder of the game. Brady finds a Tate and Liza, though. Immediately slams that thing down and is like, I need to refill this hand. I need to go for five new cards for sure. And we have to imagine that time has got to be running low now at this point in the game. Like I said previously, these players only have 30 minutes plus three to complete their match. And the Regigigas Waylord stall deck can have a tough time completing games in that time window like we're seeing here. Brady does have a max potion. He's just going to heal. And Steven's Resolve. So Brady is back on that Steven's Resolve grind, which means that 
he is going to be able to stack his hand from here on out. But time is the real question. Can Brady actually mill Cody out of the game while preventing him from taking all six prizes all before time runs out? It's a very interesting question here. We see Brady is trying to play as quickly as as he can. He knows that time is of the essence here. Cody also not wasting any time, though, just uh, going in. I think Cody is like pretty confident that he might be able to take these remaining two prizes that he has. Brady's stacking his hand now, though. We can see getting some useful things, he's getting the enhanced hammer. He's got the wondrous labyrinth as well. And Brady will lose some mean to get Stevens Resolve and probably a Plumeria, if I had to guess. Looks like he's actually grabbing Acerola. I think I want to see energy removed from this uh, Zeb Strika. Cody has got the immediate response. And I'm not sure that Brady knows exactly how low on energy Cody is, but it is very low. Uh, and Cody actually cannot perform that attack. He doesn't have the energy, right? So uh, I might have to ask that there to the judges. I don't think... Cody, unless there's a second lightning on that, someone might have to go stop the game if there is someone in there uh, who can maybe call the judge. I will call the front of Full Grip Games if I have to. Folks, Natalie is uh, not here right now. So, yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to call Full Grip Games. Yep. Let's see. We're going to call Full Grip. Uh, let's see, we could probably call Sean. Yeah, I'll call Sean Lydon. And then we're going to get somebody to go stop that. Oh, it looks like, okay, the damage was removed. Very good. So we're good. Excellent. Natalie will be here shortly. She'll be able to stop these kinds of things from happening. So that would be fantastic. All right. Gameplay fixed. This is the kind of thing we get without a table, Judge. I'm actually in the other room for people who are not familiar with my setup. I'm not actually even in the same room as them, so I can't just kind of holler at them. I could just sit here and yell at my screen like the rest of you guys. So Brady is in a pretty fine spot here. He's got that Stevens Resolve train going and is able to find the cards he needs every turn to deny Cody these prizes. And we see that Cody's hand is actually pretty much devoid completely of energy. Cody has to resort to using Flying Flip here, and uh, Flying Flip, not the worst thing, because he is getting some extra damage onto the Magikarp Waylord as well. But Brady kind of sees his outs here, and is going to start pulling up random things, healing here and there, right? Trying to strand cards active while Cody runs out of resources. He's got the Mount Lana Kila as well, increasing the retreat cost of Cody's Pokemon as well, like this Marshadow that is now stuck in the active position. So, Cody does have another Shrine. If there's one thing Cody has, it's Shrines. He's also got Switch. So, he can switch one more time. I just don't think that it's necessarily going to be enough to win the game. He can Flying Flip for 20, 30 after the Shrine damage. Ooh, 50, 60 after the Shrine damage, actually. So not horrible, but probably going to be too little too late. You know Brady's hand is absolutely stacked. But the question is, can Brady actually win in the time he has? He has to try and deck Cody out. Cody's got about six cards, maybe five, left in deck. We know that Brady is not going to win with Unknown Hand. I don't think that he has enough turns to get 35 cards in hand while limiting Cody's damage output. So he's got to go for the full-on mill. Looks like Brady is just going to Steven's Resolve here and get himself three more cards in his hand. Cody has got another opportunity to Flying Flip. That Magikarp Wailer is going to be going up to... 70 damage. I don't think there's enough Electro Powers or Electro Chargers in this deck for Cody to take the one-hit KO here. And Cody has got to have, I think he's got a Cynthia in his hand, so Cody's intelligently just not playing any cards from his hand right now and is more or less biding his time, just kind of waiting. 
doesn't think that Brady is going to be able to mill him out. Now, Brady does have the Faba, so he's going to max potion Faba and then just take another hit from Shrine. Now, Cody does have multiple Electro Powers in his hand and Kakui, which is tough. He also has a um, Tapu Koko Prism Star in his hand that he's never going to get to use because he has too many Pokemon in play. So I think Cody has to try and use the element of surprise here to try and win this game with maybe a gigantic Zapdos attack with multiple Electro Powers and Kakui. But Brady's got the Mount Lanakila, which means that the Shrine is going to stop ticking away at the Magikarp Waylord. And Cody cannot retreat this Tapu Koko promo for free right so it's really tough i think if cody just kind of buys his time here kind of just you know that's time i hear time in the round matt is calling time now so that means that brady has two or three turns to win this game so all cody has to do is not lose which means that he just needs to pass pass then cynthia and cody is going to tie brady and unfortunately, it looks like the stall deck not equipped to be able to take the win in the time constraints here. Brady's going to check Cody's hand. That's right. There's no energy there. Absolutely none. Cody was not saving anything up. So unless Brady's got an unknown play up his sleeve, I don't think that he does because I think that he's also short of the cards that he needs. And Cody is just going to kind of solidify the tie here with the Cynthia. Like I said, he knows that they are in plus three turns and that neither of these players is going to end up on top after this long and grueling match. Folks, this is uh, definitely one of the downfalls of the stall deck in a best of one format. 50 minutes best of three is uh, much more kind. That being said, if you're playing 50 minutes best of three and you're playing the stall deck, Cody, you still can't retreat. But if you're playing the stall deck, you still might just get benched game one and then have to fight all the way back game two. Very hard to complete three games with the stall deck in a 50 minutes best of three. So you definitely know have to know how to use the clock to your advantage. And that's it. Round one going to a tie. Stunfisk against... Waylord Vileplume. Definitely an interesting match. And we see some trash can emotes getting sent to the chat. Which deck is that being targeted at, chat? All right. We'll be back with round two shortly. Brady Bonner, everybody. Ended with a tie there, round one, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah uh, just, I don't really play these decks very often, so like I'm not really like confident with like how fast I need to play so I mean just ends up with ties sometimes yeah it's all good <laughs> yeah. I mean 30 minutes you gotta right. you kind of have to know your route right, like right, exactly right. what yeah. you're doing and uh it's a tough deck to play mm -hmm. when you have the entire deck at your disposal every turn with the Stevens Resolve right. you're trying to plan multiple turns in advance and uh not to mention you just have no idea what's in Cody's deck yeah right yeah who knows <laughs> yeah I didn't know he played Let Loose that really that caught me off guard <laughs> yeah I didn't think he played Let Loose either so that kind of came as a surprise I didn't know that he played so many Electro Chargers either I didn't know he played two of those yeah so, yeah. so that was big getting yeah. to throw oh, the Electro sure, Powers sure. back into the deck right the Zip Strike has put in a lot of work as well yeah I really underestimated the the 60 every turn yeah <laughs> So we've got the chat asking, what would drive someone to want to play a deck like this? Um, it's just like, it's unique. It's like fun to, for me at least, I've never played a deck like this until like a few weeks ago. So like it was fun to learn something completely new. Like I've always only played like like B-string decks and like decks that are like one energy, like swing for a lot of decks. And so like, Zapdos and Blasepha. Yeah, and like, like, like Buzzgarf Shine, Buzz like Night March, like yeah. those kind of things, right? So like uh, out of learning something like this is just like, I don't know, it's unique, and I just wanted to do it, I guess, yeah. Right. <laughs> I feel you, yeah, yeah. I feel you. I haven't uh, ever really taken to a stall deck myself, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a unique skill, and it gives you a different way of kind of looking at the game, trying to achieve different win-outs, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it can allow you to see some of those other uh, 
those other routes when you're playing in maybe other games. Right. Yeah. So definitely cool. Uh, are you going to any tournaments here coming up soon? Uh, Hartford. Hartford. Excellent. So we're going to be gearing up, and uh, let me know if you want to test some expanded before yeah. Hartford. Sounds good. I think I hear Matt yelling out there. So. All right, cool. Yep, good All luck around right. round two, Thank you. Brady. Yep. Gearing up for round two here at the Full Grip Games League Challenge. We've got Will Mantho on the left versus Jesse Parker. Jesse has got his Blacephalon deck for us tonight. Will is going to be playing a Zapdos Ultra Beast deck, his favorite deck to play right now. Jesse has been tearing up the local scene lately, and that is the closest I've ever seen the dice fly to the cameras. That was pretty impressive, Will. Definitely, definitely a nice toss. Will has been playing the Zapdos Ultra Beast deck to some success here on the local scene. It actually looks like he's not playing Zapdos Ultra Beast. This could be maybe Zapdos Lycanroc featuring a Buzzwool or something. So that might be what we got going on on Will's side. And then Jesse playing Blacephalon. Jesse, as I was saying, has been tearing up the local scene here. I know he is pretty much capped out on League Cup and League Challenge points. He has been placing very well at locals, which is no easy task for anybody who's been uh, playing in a lot of League Cups and League Challenges this year. That can sometimes be the most difficult part of the, of the tournament series is uh, doing well at these local championships. I know it has definitely been... Uh, some trying times for me trying to get all my cup finishes. So Jesse being able to do that, no small task. Will, as I had said previously, is a finalist for regional championships last year and a Worlds competitor himself. Jesse looking for his first Worlds invite this year. And I think Jesse is nearing about 500 championship points last I checked. So he's done that almost entirely on the back of local tournaments. I think he's got one top 64 from a regionals and then otherwise has pretty much capped out on all local tournaments to get the rest of those points. All right, yes, I was going to say that is a pretty weak handshake, but it's okay. Looks like Jesse is going to be on the draw here and starts his Ditto Prism Star, has a Blacephalon in hand, is going to Mysterious Treasure away a fire to get this party started. And it looks like Will actually just has a Rock Ruff in the active with a Tapu Coco Prism Star on the bench. So no Zapdos in sight. But we do have a Ditto Prism Star who Jesse can use to evolve into a Naganadel at some point later in the game or an Alolan Muck, which could be very good against Will's Zapdos deck. And... Could be something that we see come into play here. Jesse discarding the fire energy is going to be grabbing a let loose Mars Shadow. So it's good that Will went ahead and benched that Tapu Koko Prism Star preemptively because he could have his hand limited turn one to just four cards. And we see, let's see, he's got the Blacephalon bench to fire on the active ditto and we'll let loose. Looking for a Lily here. Interesting thing about some of these Blacephalon lists that I've seen, uh, most notably the one that Zach Lesage has been playing, is that they seem to have cut the Tapu Lele GX from the list, which can create some very odd turn ones. In a traditional hand, you might have gone for a Mysterious Treasure for Tapu Lele to guarantee a big draw supporter turn one. Instead, without Tapu Lele in the deck, just got to go for Let Loose and hope you draw into a supporter. So... The loose and prey strategy coming into full effect here on Jesse's side of the field. It looks like he's going to draw four cards looking for a lily. And sure enough, we see another mysterious treasure. Now, looks like Jesse could channel his inner Marshadow and go for it again, which is something that I have seen this deck do from time to time. Sure enough, there it goes. Yeah. Will showing his hand off. Okay. Going for that second let loose. And it's times like this that I really, really wish that the uh, Blacephalon deck still was playing the Tapu Lele GX. I think that Tapu Lele, such a good card and such a good consistency booster that it, it kind of hurts me to see a hand like we just saw from Jesse not get a Tapu Lele to Lily for seven or eight cards, right? So just a little... Uh, a little opinion from me, but 
we'll see how it works out. Maybe Jesse rips the lily here and is off to the races with his second attempt at finding a card here off of a second level. He's got, sure enough, everything he needs. And we see Jesse exclaiming, busted deck, right? He's got the Heat Factory and with Lily for six, filling his hand to eight cards on the first turn of the game. And we'll go ahead and be able to Heat Factory as well, playing that Heat Factory down pretty excitedly. He's got the Fire Energy in his hand too, so he's going to be able to discard that going for a draw of three. Now, with the release of Unbroken Bonds coming shortly, it'll be interesting to see how these new cards affect the metagame. Let Loose is for sure a ruling standard format right now with players' hands constantly being shortened to four on the first turn of the game. Dedene GX is a newcomer to standard format who will allow players to fill their hand to six, discard hand, full, uh, draw six cards when it is played from the hand to the bench. So I think that Dedene GX will be played alongside Marshadow to create some pretty explosive draw engines. And that should be exciting to see how that shakes out in standard. Jesse opts to go grab another Poiple here. And it's going to have a Ditto and a Poiple on his bench. Will immediately has got the counter there. And Will Lily for a draw of five. And it looks like he draws into an awkward hand full of switches, a baby Blacephalon, no Jirachi in sight. Will really wants to see a Jirachi here to help kind of fix this hand. But Will just has to pass. His hand is hot garbage. Literally nothing usable in that hand. And we see Jesse going for an Ultra Ball. So he's going to have to discard two cards and get himself a Pokemon from the deck. I think that grabbing the Alolan Muck here would be pretty insane. And we also see that Jesse does have a Cynthia in his hand. I think Jesse for sure wants to find Alolan Muck. That would be phenomenal to shut down Will's Tapu Koko Prism Star before he's even able to get started. And sure enough, we see Jesse Parker grabbing it. Sees the play right ahead there. He's going to grab the old muck. That Power of Alchemy ability shutting down any hope Will has of using basic Pokemon's abilities. That means no Jirachi, no Stellar Wish, no Tapu Koko Prism Star. As we can see, Will has only played one card from hand this game. Uh, two, actually. He's got the Thunder Mountain Prism Star and the Lily. That's it. Will has also benched one Buzzwall, but has had a very underwhelming turn. The one turn he got to play. And what's crazy is Jesse's deck is just firing on all six cylinders. He got double let loose turn one. Turn two, he's got the Muck and the Naginato with Blacephalon in the active position. He's going to be going for a Burst GX here. And this is exactly what makes Blacephalon just such a scary deck to play against is that no matter what is on the other side of the field, it doesn't matter because if Blacephalon sets up and does exactly what it's supposed to do, then it can, uh, it can just shut down any strategy or any deck, right? And we see Burst GX there actually finding Jesse the Beast energy. And if you read Burst GX, it says discard one of your prize cards if it's an energy card attached to one of your Pokemon. So the Beast energy, a valid target there for Burst GX. And it looks like Will just has to evolve into Lycanroc. Use Bloodthirsty Eyes to try to strand up the muck while Will looks for a draw card or an energy or literally anything. The thing about trying to stall Blacephalon, though, is that they will just stack energy on their side of the field while uh, while they wait. But Jesse is wasting no time. He's actually just got the he's got the mind blown for two hundred and two hundred and eighty damage. He could do two hundred and eighty damage this turn if he needed to. He doesn't need to though, so he's probably just going to sack the four fire energies to the lost zone. Mind blown for a perfect 200 damage, taking two prizes here. 
Jesse going down to just three prizes remaining while Will draws absolutely nothing. He's got a lightning energy, but I can I can feel it in my bones. Will has got to be close to conceding here. Will will usually throw in the towel when he knows he can't win, and I feel like he's probably fighting all of the urges in his body to just throw in the game because he knows he's on camera. So thank you, Will, for sticking this one out. I appreciate it. Even if Jesse is just really routing you here, really no chance for Will, unfortunately. Look at that hand. That is one of the worst hands I think I have ever seen from a Zapdos deck. There is no hope for young William here. Unfortunate for sure. He's got Tapu Koko GX. Can't use it. Marshadow. Can't use it. Two switches. What's the point? And an Electro Power. That is all. It's looking like it has been a tough day for the Zapdos Lycanroc deck, and that is one of my major beefs with the Zapdos Lycanroc deck, is that it seems slightly less consistent than just straight Zapdos builds. The Lycanroc doesn't actually bring a whole lot to the archetype. Obviously, it does allow you to hit for fighting weakness, which is huge, but it doesn't bring any consistency to the deck, which is one of my major issues. Or you could be playing cards like maybe Zepstrika in that spot or things like that. Really, uh, you know, I think that it really does take away from the just raw consistency of the Zapdos deck. But when it works, it is obviously very good. Adler was able to finish in the top eight of the Denver Regional Championships with his own Zapdos Lycanroc deck. Certainly a proven archetype, just not my favorite way to run the deck. And we're seeing here why. Jesse's got the mind blown. 430 damage, perfect numbers to knock that out. And uh, I think if Will doesn't scoop here, I would be very surprised. He's got to let loose. He has to bench for nothing. Three electro powers in his hand. He's going to escape rope, see if maybe he could get Jesse to stumble here. And I think Will just has to pass with the Marshadow in the active position. Actually, the Tapu Koko Prism Star in the active position. And he's going to bench the Tapu Koko GX. Play all three Electro Powers. Why would you do that? He <laughs> doesn't even... Will is just playing the cards to play the cards. You just keep the Electro Powers, Will. There's really... I know you're frustrated, but no real reason to do that. Sure enough, Jesse's got everything he needs to take another knockout here. And I think Will is just going to give him the win. Uh, there ain't nothing that Will could do here. He's got... The Tapu Koko GX of the active gives Jesse the Viridian. Uh, no real reason to give him the Viridian there. I think that uh, at the very least you just keep that in your hand. But at this point, Will knows he can't win. There is absolutely nothing that Will can do to win the game. And it looks like Jesse may have been uh, throwing his fire energy not into the loss zone, which is unfortunate. So he's actually been... Uh, Potentially putting that in the discard instead. So let's hope that that never became an issue. And it looks like uh, Will never really stood a chance anyway. So really tough game there for Will. Uh, looks like Jesse is going to move on to 2-0 uh, for this game here at the Full Group Games League Challenge. Jesse Parker, hot off a win there with his... Blacephalon Fire Blacephalon Let's deck. <laughs> Let's go. All right, yeah, Jesse. So, a uh, little bit about today. Uh, I already have two first place league challenge finishes, so I just thought I would play a deck that I don't usually play, which right. is Blacephalon, and Sweet. then I'll scoop to people. So, Oh, uh, that's so nice of you, yeah, Jesse. Yeah, so I scooped to Will, but we played it on anyways. Oh, uh, well, good guy yeah, Jesse yeah. Parker <laughs> out here. He's <laughs> not him. trying to throw points into the void. Yeah, uh, He's trying to help some brothers out. So. Right, yeah, there's literally no point in playing if you have two first place. So. Um, right, can't so let me explain five. that real quick for the chat. Yeah, with the way that the seasons work, it's like you got four quarters to a championship point year, and each quarter you can have two finishes for league challenges, and Jesse's got two firsts. Yep. So he can't get any more championship points. And he yeah, knows so that Will's in the hunt for an invite he still. Is, yeah. So he's uh grinding right now. He's go he's going to Daytona this weekend, I think, and then he's him and me are both going to Hartford. So uh, Excellent. Yeah, so 
Uh, fun game, though. I told him right before the game started, I said, so this will make the let loose to a dead hand sting that much less. That right. Much less. So that's what ended up happening. So. Oh, that, that's, uh, that's yeah. nice of you, Jesse. So. Thanks so. for being a good sport oh, yeah, out no there. Problem. Appreciate it. Just How many championship playing. points are you at? 424. Okay. So four getting, there. getting there. Yep. In the hunt. Yep. And that uh, last little stretch here, so hopefully the first quarter isn't a complete bust, but... Uh, yeah, just got to right. do well at, like, one more regional, and I think I'll be pretty much there for cups. Exactly. Just getting cups, so, yeah. Right, just yeah. another top be in your four, bracket or just top 32. Yeah. Yes, that's how <laughs> I must feel good. very <laughs> thankful, because you were smoking me, like, oh, two yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, you're like, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that uh, regional finish is definitely, uh, yeah. definitely nice. That was much needed. Yeah, yeah, that was that was good. Yes, getting the uh, from three ninety nine to four ninety nine feels. Uh, four, yeah, so you're four ninety nine. Okay, yeah, exactly. wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> see, that's why you that's why you got to best these finishes because then you get to like five forty nine or four ninety nine. You get on that awkward odd number, and then like you, it's just super awkward. So I know you got to even out those points. I know. I was telling the chat earlier if I could go to if I could play. Yeah, this play in this one. Tonight, oh, I'll stream. Go go. <laughs> I would have been playing. We're going to start out with a two-round loss. Okay. <laughs> I yeah, can get in there. I can still get points, right? Yeah, yeah well, no. We got not. 21 players here good. tonight. It's going to be yeah. a five-round challenge. So pretty. Uh, Five round. Oh, my gosh. Good thing yeah. I know I've worked tomorrow. There Ooh. you go. Ooh. I know. It's going to take a while. Uh, didn't I see you were wearing a tie earlier, right? I was wearing a tie. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I work at a bank, and uh, people come in sometimes last second with like, big bags of deposits. Ah. So I didn't get out of work at the time I would have liked. So oh. I didn't get a chance to change. So I come in all fancy. Like, uh, fancy I know I didn't get to look fancy on stream. Oh, well. I oh, changed well. too soon. It's all good. It's all Gotta good. change into your street clothes, man. <laughs> Casuals. Uh, that's right. I get to go to work every day wearing my street oh, clothes. Oh man, I'm so I jealous. Know. Oh, I love it, that's man. suit, man. It's just, I know, it's a little much sometimes. I know. When I was teaching, man, I used to have to, you know, get dry cleaning like every other week. Oh, get my man. shirts pressed. Now, uh, psh, whatever, no, 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 t-shirts no, no. every day. That's awesome. It is. It is definitely for sure. Living so, the life. Going to Hartford. Going to Daytona. You've been practicing. I'm not going to Daytona. Not going to Daytona. Yeah, yeah I'm. You're I couldn't get off. Her. Yeah, I'm going to Hartford and then Madison. Oh, okay. Madison's pretty much guaranteed. Uh, it's a maybe if I do well enough at Hartford, I won't go to Madison. And then there's internets, obviously, or See? nationals. So, which is right in our backyard, which is busted. So. Oh, for sure. Oh, I love that. It's so have nice. you uh, <laughs> been testing expanded format? I at have. All? Yeah, and honestly, I just cannot find a deck that I like. I yeah. cannot find a deck. So I'm really just like I'll play anything at this point. I just need something to give me points. It'll probably end up being Pika Ram, but I don't know. And anything's possible. So we'll see what happens at Daytona. So. Oh, for sure, for sure. Eggs is looking spicy. Telling yeah, I have not played a lick of Expanded yet. I yeah, took no, a nice it's... vacation from Expanded after uh, what Greensboro and uh, Canada. Yeah. Toronto, but uh, yeah, Pika Ram, yeah, dude. Yeah. I just like it's such a hard form. Like there's so many things in this great. format. It's crazy. Like there's so there much. Are. Like you can't really expect anything. Like you just gotta. Like, you can play against some random things I've never read before, so it's like, I don't right. know. It could be anything. I feel it. Well, yeah. congrats, right. Jesse. Thank you. Good sport. Thank you for being a good sport here at the no Fulgur Games League Challenge, man. And cool. uh, congrats on the win. But, you know, we'll be seeing you in more tournaments to come. Definitely. Getting ready for round three here at the Fulgur Games League Challenge. We've got Nick Moses on the left versus Will Mantho on the right. Will Mantho getting a second chance here. Jesse Parker gave him the win last round after defeating him since Jesse already has his two first place league challenge finishes this quarter, propelling Will to 2 0. Nick Moses also 2 0. These players competing here for the top spot at today's 21-player five-round league challenge on a Wednesday night here at Full Grip Games. This is going to be a Zapdos mirror. We saw last round Will is playing Zapdos Lycanroc. He's going to be hoping that his Zapdos Lycanroc deck functions a little bit stronger than it did against Jesse's Blacephalon deck last round. Nick also has a Zapdos deck. Nick usually will play Malamar decks from what I've seen week to week here at Full Grip, but it looks like he's trying out something new for us all today in the form of Zapdos. Zapdos mirror matches can be tight for sure, and a lot of times we'll come down to who takes the first prize. So excited to see how this mirror match falls here with two very strong players at the Folk of Games League Challenger waiting to get started now, waiting for 
Matt's call here to get that timer going. And usually the player going first is at a disadvantage. Sometimes they'll be at a disadvantage because the player going second has an opportunity to get the turn one attack. And if the player going a second can get that turn one knockout, they can usually keep that lead for the duration of the game. We do see Nick's hand, though, is very dead. He's just got a Lightning Viridian, maybe a Switch card, and a couple copies of Electro Power. I think he's got a Guzma in the hand as well, but no actual draw supporter for turn, which could prove to be devastating here for Nick in a mirror match that is extraordinarily fast-paced. Zapdos wants to be taking a prize every single turn. Missing even one turn of a knockout could lose the game entirely for that player. So we'll see what Will's opening hand is looking like here. And if he's got a stronger start than Nick, Will could be moving on to 3-0 here shortly. But you never want to count out the fact that the top deck does exist. I can't tell you how many times I have been saved by the top deck on the first turn of the game or by my opponent let loosing me into a more playable hand. That'll happen from time to time as well. This is something in the Pokemon trading card game that is uh, very interesting, the fact that you don't actually get to intentionally mulligan in Magic the Gathering. They actually just came out with new mulliganing rules to uh, kind of... Uh, just change the way the mulliganing process works, but Magic the Gathering does have an intentional mulligan that you can choose to do, which ends up decreasing your hand size every time you do it, but uh, does help for situations like this one. Looks like Nick actually starts Jirachi, so this could all end up buffing out for Nick entirely. That Stellar Wish could very well save him. Will is going to be starting out with his baby Buzzwool here and a Nest Ball. It's going to be searching out his own Stellar Wish Jirachi and will be looking to use Stellar Wish there to get better cards into his hand. Though I think that having the Buzzwell in the active position is not actually horrible because he can wall with that on the first turn. The Buzzwell is very difficult to take down for Zapdos decks requiring multiple Electro Powers. Will's got the Escape Board and the Escape Rope, and Will Lily for five. So a great turn one here from Lily uh, from Will. With that turn one, Lily finding himself another Nest Ball and a Lightning Energy, which is already better than we saw him do last game. That Nest Ball is going to be able to search Will out a Zapdos so that he can start to prepare a valid attacker in this matchup when we see him thumbing that Zapdos there to the front of his deck and grabbing it right away. He's going to want to suit that up with the Lightning Energy and prepare his board to take a turn two knockout. And it looks like he also has a Fighting Energy, a second Lightning Energy. He's going to Ultra Ball those away to actually get himself something else. And it looks like he's making room on his bench for potentially the Absol could come down to disrupt his opponent a little bit. Could also get himself a Rock Rough if he thinks that Lycan Rock is going to help. Looks like he's just grabbing the Absol. I think that's a great play there. Getting the Absol onto the bench early is going to disrupt Nick and keep him from potentially getting that turn one attack that he so desperately wants going second in a tight mirror match. Will is going to Stellar Wish here. Look at the top five cards of his deck and put one trainer card into his hand. He sees a Judge or a Guzma potentially that he could grab. I think Rescue Stretcher is a decent option as well in case one of his Pokemon does get knocked out on the first turn of the game. So very good call there. And he's already got a Cynthia and energy in his hand. Will's actually going to pivot to the Buzzwall. I think if I'm Will, I actually don't mind just attaching the lightning energy to the Zapdos so that next turn, if you wanted to, you could just get a bonus attachment in. I think getting bonus attachments is not bad, though. Will Will knows his deck. He knows what he wants, and I'm sure you know knows what he's doing here, but I, I don't think I mind getting the Lightning on the Zapdos, though I think he only has one Lightning in his hand, and 
Will knows to be very scared of the mirror match. Nick could just go Nest Ball for Zapdos, Electro Power, Lightning, Guzma, the Zapdos with the Lightning Energy on it, and then Will could be stuck without an attack. So upon further you know, inspection, I think given Will's hand with only one Lightning Energy in it, I think he's correct to save the energy because if Nick were to target down that Zapdos and knock it out, he would be in a very compromising situation where with Rescue Stretcher and Lightning in his hand, he can respond to anything Nick throws at him this turn with a convincing knockout. So I do like that play. Nick is going to Stellar Wish here with his Jirachi, grabbing a Lily, which is fantastic. So he's going to be able to get a turn one draw here and actually get some more cards into this hand, though I do know his hand is filled with a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of electro powers and things like that. So I don't think he'll necessarily want to burn too many of those. We do see him suit up the Zapdos though. And sure enough, go straight for that Absol. So I think Will is probably correct to hold on to that lightning energy because that could have easily have been the Zapdos that bit the dust. Will's going to promote his Jirachi. Sure enough, top deck's another lightning energy and is going to be going in with his own Zapdos this turn. But Nick does get the turn one knockout which we said is so significant in this matchup because it's just going to be a matter of keeping pace now. Each player is going to try and take a knockout every single turn until the game concludes. Will finds that judge again, decides to grab it this time. And fortunately for Will, Nick does not have his own Absol in play right now. So his Jirachi is going to get free retreat with that escape board. Looks like... Will is actually going to Guzma the Jirachi. And I love this play from Will. Just kind of trying to take the legs out from underneath the deck. Will knows that the Jirachi is the draw power of the deck. Now Nick does have a Lily in his hand. We already know this. He grabbed it last turn. But making Nick promote the Zapdos means that Nick could miss the attack that he so desperately wants to launch. And we see Nick's hand is huge. He might have to actually Viridian to discard a card and then not actually search out the energy this turn. I think I like that. I think I want to see him maybe Viridian and discard the Guzma, play the Lightning Energy Escape Rope, right? And then Lily, something like that, uh, for just as many cards as he can find. I think you have to, I think you have to Viridian that there just to give yourself an out. But sure enough, I think he actually has the attack here. He can escape rope into the Tapu Koko and then can Viridian to retreat the Tapu Koko for free. And I think he might also have a switch. And I'm not sure if it's a switch. He does. So he can knock out the active, which is absolutely crazy. He's got everything that he needs here. He just needs to Viridian away I was going to say he just needs to Viridian away one of those, and he could have just retreated the Tapu Koko. But getting the Zapdos back out in the active, he's not actually going to take a knockout. I think Nick just had to see that he could retreat the Tapu Koko Prism Star, but he might not have seen it there. I don't think Nick used his own Viridian that turn, which is really tough for Nick. Missing this knockout is absolutely huge. Though I do think that Will is kind of stuck uh, unless he's got a switch he's just got an escape rope so he can maybe swing into this tapu coco prism star but knocking out tapu coco prism star is no easy feat either we see will opt to viridian away his own lightning to grab a fighting energy he's probably gonna slap that onto the buzzwell escape rope promote the jirachi and just go from there but Will might not be able to get a knockout. Looks like Will's just going to fail. He's going to fail the Viridian and then Cynthia. I think I want to see Will use the escape rope there. He could throw out the Jirachi into the active, get a guaranteed switch, and then all he has to do is find an Electro Power off the Cynthia. Uh, or not Electro Power, two Electro Powers, but I mean... Seems better than his outs here. I also like the out, whereas if Will played that escape rope, he could find the beast energy and then knock out the Tapu Koko Prism Star with the beast energy on the 
Buzzwool. Instead, we're going to have an extremely lackluster turn from Will here, where he just has to pass with his baby Buzzwool in the active. Unless there's a switch that I'm missing in his hand, but I don't think that I saw a switch in Will's hand here. So Nick might be able to just get the legs that he needs in this matchup right here with Will also seemingly missing a knockout with his baby Buzzwell in the active position. Really unfortunate situation for Will. I think he needed to route that turn a little bit differently. With the awkwardness, there's just no point in leaving that baby Buzzwell out there. You kind of have to welcome up the Tapu Koko Prism Star and hope for the best. But we see Will kind of considering, you know, going through the motions here with this turn, having that baby Buzzwell in the active was a great thing because it prevented Nick from taking a prize, but it's also been a huge bummer because he couldn't move it when he needed to. I think Nick actually just has an Electro Power and may just Thunderous Assault with his active Zapdos for knockout on this Buzzwool without playing any Switch cards. I don't think I see too much else. He's got Guzma, so he certainly could Guzma this turn and maybe target down a Jirachi or something like that, though I think that Probably taking out the Buzzwool is not a bad idea. It's got an energy on it. Uh, not bad at all. He's got Thunder Mountain Prism Star in his hand. It's not really doing him any good right now. I think Nick is making the right play here, just knocking out the active Buzzwool and saving the Switch cards. I think you want to save the Switch, save the Guzma, because you could need those in future turns, and he didn't actually need them to take a knockout this turn. Will promotes the Jirachi and has an Electro Power in his hand, so he's got a guaranteed knockout on the Zapdos. I don't think that there's too much more to consider other than that. I think you just knock out the Zapdos and proceed. So just kind of build your hand up, grab that other Electro Power just so that you can guarantee knock out another Zapdos the following turn. You've got guaranteed Lightning Energy Flow here, back-to-back -back turns, but it looks like Will might grab a switch. I think. Personally, I like just kind of loading up the hand with the Electro Power, since in the mirror you want to just use Electro Power every single turn to KO Zapdoses, and that's like the biggest thing is when you miss the Electro Power in the mirror match, you miss a knockout, and missing knockouts loses games. So Will grabs the switch, which is not bad. I think he might be anticipating that Nick does not get a knockout this next turn, which would make the switch a good call for sure. Will does slam down that Electro Power and will take the knockout on Nick's Zapdos there. And sure enough, Nick is just sat there wondering, you know, what am I going to do with this hand? It looks like Nick is just going to scoop. He's got nothing, and Will has everything that he needs to potentially get a knockout that next turn. We know he did have the switch. All he would have needed was, I guess, two Electro Powers. He's asking for quite a bit, but... Nick having to pass with a single Tapu Koko Prism Star in the active. He knows that in a mirror match like this, it's not going to work out. So Will, moving on to 3-0 here at the Full Group Games League Challenge. All right, we got busted Will Mantho <laughs> here. Hot <laughs> off his Zapdos mirror win. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty cool-looking hat you got there, Will. Where'd you get that? Oh, from the World Championships in 2018. Oh, are you a competitor there? I was. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, very cool. Excellent. So, Zapdos, I saw you're playing Lycanroc in your deck now, right? Yeah. Well, why are you doing that? Because Zapdos Beast was getting really boring, so I wanted to change it up. You wanted some spice, huh? Mm hmm Was this Adler's List from Top 8? Yeah, the same list. Same list. How mm -hmm. have you been liking it so far? Well, it's my first time playing it, and it's horrible, honestly. <laughs> I honestly don't know how it wins any games. Yeah, I, I haven't started Jirachi once yet today, <laughs> and I just, like, finessed my my. my, my Seems <laughs> sketchy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was saying that during your loss to Placephalon, which should be an auto, like, should just be a win, right? Yeah. <laughs> Granted, Jesse just teed off. Like The first lit list was fine, though. I would, probably would have won with that hand. <laughs> but then your Lily, your Lily was, I think that was the worst hand I've ever seen in Zapdos <laughs> deck off your Lily. I actually was just proud of you for not insta-conceding. I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> And then Jesse goes, like, turn two muck, turn two negative, <laughs> burst for the beast. Like, yeah, I know. After that, I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Strap in, folks. But uh, 
Yeah, so I think that, uh, yeah, we're probably in agreement. Just straight Zapdos is probably more consistent. Yeah, I, I don't like this host at all. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. got to try out different things. League Challenge kind of a perfect place to try out some different lists. So. Mm. You were traveling to Daytona this weekend, though. I am, yeah. Yeah, and the hunt for that world invitation. So yeah. how many championship points you had so far? 341. Okay, so we are in the hunt. Yes, <laughs> we are going to need a big finish from Big Willie Style Try here. Any amount of points. <laughs> <laughs> how many points do you have, Andrew? I have 499. Wow, you can just like not do anything. Uh, well, I have to do a little bit of things. Just not much, <laughs> though. Yeah. You have to win two cups and place that challenge. One Win one cup. Oh, yeah, win one cup. One oh, cup. Top eight, two cups, and you play that challenge. <laughs> yes, I could do that. That is one of the many combos I can create. So you are going to need a little bit more of a substantial. I think a top eight would just be just what the doctor ordered for you. That <laughs> Pro- would be hopefully. great. 100 points, yeah, <laughs> just gets you up to like 450. That oh, would yeah, feel, I'd, I'd be fine with that. That would be, that'd be great. So have you done any expanded testing? You ready for uh, these two expanded regionals back-to-back? My testing was Greensboro and Toronto, so. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, that's right. Yes, you told me. Yeah, yeah. You might not be switching it up too much. Nope. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> One thing uh, about Will, I will say, Will kind of locks into a deck and just rocks that deck pretty much all year. Oh, yeah. Is that a strategy you think that has paid off for you in the past? Well, last year it did. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it absolutely did. When I first met Will, what was the deck, Will? <laughs> Volcanion. Volcanion, that's right. He played Volcanion. Mm-hmm. And then eventually he saw the truth with Buzzwell and then didn't budge from Buzzwell for like another eight months. <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, I played Hoopa for like a short time. But. You did, yeah. <laughs> and then it was Buzz Garb Shrine. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then and we, we, we got off of that. <laughs> and we got off of that. Yeah. And then uh, you kind of... You kind of felt lost, I think, until Zapdos came out. Oh, yeah. I was not feeling it. <laughs> Never not, no, which is, I think, you had the different championship points there in the middle quarters, and then Zapdos came out, and you've been, you've been feeling it. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. Well, I'm glad you found a deck that you enjoy, uh, for sure, in standard format. So, excellent to see, and hopefully you can... Oh, burp there. <laughs> hopefully you can gain much-needed championship points here in oh, your yeah. final two rounds. 15 points. I mean, 15 points, 15 points. So. Yeah, that's pretty good. Excellent <laughs> stuff, man. Well, congrats, Will. And, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll be seeing you in the final rounds. Getting ready for round four, the Four Games League Challenge. We've got Brady Botner on the left versus Holden Sheiks on the right. Holden is 3-0 currently with his fighting deck. Should be an interesting matchup. As we saw earlier, Brady is piloting that Regigigas stall deck. So Regigigas could be a problem for this fighting deck. I mean, most certainly Violet Plume could be tough for the fighting deck to deal with unless Holden plays Lycanroc GX is a valid option for these fighting archetypes. But uh, I'm not exactly sure. Holden might also have Lucario in his deck. Holden is definitely one to bring his own unique deck to the table here, which could be tough for Brady's meta, uh, kind of meta counter deck to handle. The thing about the Vileplume stall deck is that it very much wants to play against meta decks that it knows and can counter. It's much easier to pilot the Vileplume stall deck when you are directly countering things that your opponent is doing and when you know the counts of specific cards in their deck. But when you're playing against a rogue deck or maybe a less established archetype, can be tough to predict your opponent's next move and I think that that will probably play to Holden's advantage here. Buzzwool's Jet Punch Attack, also great for picking off the pesky little Oddishes early on as well. Looks like Holden's going to start double Buzzwell GX while Brady starts Hoopa, a fantastic starter for Brady. Looks like Brady has been able to win each of his last two games since since uh, his tie round one. Hoopa is a great starter for Brady, but Holden probably plays some non-GX Buzzwells in his deck, if I had to imagine and Sledgehammer can knock out Hoopas if he has a beast energy attached. It looks like Holden is going to kind of speed things up here and just start to play his hand. I actually think Holden should probably hang tight while Brady selects the cards for Steven's Resolve because Brady might actually change his selection um, based on what he sees Holden do. 
So that's probably something that, you know, sometimes it doesn't really matter, like when players are like using full blitz or something like that, you know, you might want to just speed up the turn or whatever, but I think Holden should hang tight, wait for Brady to select his three cards so that Brady's selection is not altered by anything that Holden does, if that makes any sense. So Brady's going to grab his three cards with Steven Resolve, which ends his turn. Holden has drawn his card and used Professor Kakui. He's got an energy on his Buzzwall GX, but unfortunately that Buzzwall GX is not going to be able to damage the Hoopa that Brady has in the active position. Holden's going to need to find another non-GX Pokemon here. The Diancie not quite going to cut it, though Diancie does one-hit KO. Hoopa takes three fighting energy, which is just a lot for this deck to achieve. Holden just has to pass with the Buzzwell GX active while Brady has a Nest Ball. He's going to be able to get a, another Pokemon out of his deck, probably looking for potentially an Oddish to set up a Vileplume or just another Hoopa. I mean, Hoopas could really just get there in this matchup, especially if Holden does not eventually bench a non-GX Buzzwell. We did see that Holden does have the Beast Energy in his hand, though. So if he is able to find a non-GX Buzzwell and get it into the active position, then he is going to be able to take a, uh, a swift one-hit KO on this Hoopa with his baby Buzzwell. Now Brady, he's got two Nest Balls. He's going to be able to search out two Oddishes with those Nest Balls. And then Will Stevens again, so he's guaranteeing himself the Vile Plume. You know, he goes straight for the Rare Candy and the Vile Plume, and then we'll probably get himself another Stevens or a Lusamine, if I had to guess. I think Lusamine is probably fair. Just get yourself a couple of get yourself a couple of Stevens back into the hand, back into the deck, just in case Holden doesn't do anything. But it looks like Holden is just stuck, kind of um, having to attach again to the Buzzwall, and he's going to soften up a Oddish. I think that Holden could be in a lot of trouble here if Brady is able to evolve up into a Vile Plume. We already know that he's going to because he's got Rare Candy Vile Plume in that hand. Sure enough, here it comes. Vile Plume back in action. He's going to evolve into the one with the damage on it so that, oh my gosh, he's actually got two. Unbelievable. Brady's got two Vile Plumes. Unreal. And then we'll lose him in for his Stevens back. At this point, I'm not sure that Holden has a way to combat this. He's actually just going straight in for the Beast Energy and the Choice Band on the active and has to pass. So this is going to be a yikes from me. Brady has got these Violet Plumes out in force. Holden's going to GX for nothing. I think he's uh, kind of memeing right now, if I had to guess. I don't think that he actually has any answer for these Violet Plumes in his deck. So he's doing a ton of damage, but it doesn't matter. None of that damage is going to be able to affect the Hoopa or the Vile Plumes that we see in play. And I think that, uh, you know, Holden probably should have opted to Jet Punch because since the Vile Plumes are not in the active position, they're not actually keeping Holden from attacking. But if I had to guess, this is probably not a situation that Holden has ever encountered in a tournament. So he might not actually know that. Also, I think that... Uh, I don't know. I feel like the Diancie probably needs some energy uh, just because, I mean, he needs to deal with this Hoopa for real. So it uh, looks like he's got Ingo and Emmett. He's going to opt to discard his hand and just draw five cards off the top. So we'll see what he's got here. Max potions and uh, looks like potentially two more Ingo and Emmets in his hand, which is really awkward, right? So Holden just not drawing anything that he needs. He's got fully loaded Buzzwolves galore, but none of it actually matters. And Brady is just going to put the rainbow down onto his Hoopa and create a board position with just two Violet Plumes on it. So at this point, you know, we have to ask ourselves, does Holden have a... Sure enough, there's the baby Buzzwolf, but does he have a uh, Lycanroc in this deck? Or is it just a... Is it just a Buzzwell deck? I think from what I've seen so far, I'm probably going to guess that it is just a Buzzwell deck. I don't think that there is actually Lycanroc in here. So, looks like Holden is pointing to his Ingo and Emmett. I'm not exactly sure why. It looks like he's just going to pass 
doesn't really have anything. And Brady is back on that Steven's resolve grind. So this should just be a wash for Brady. He's pretty much playing a game against himself right now. So uh, it's just going to be a matter of how long does it take Brady to get up to 35 cards in his hand and then use unknown. That's it. There is nothing in Holden's deck that could stop this Vileplume deck from winning. And, yeah, if Holden just continues using cards like Kui and Ingo and Emmett, he is going to be decking out here pretty shortly. Now, Holden's deck is a meta call. I mean, um, it is it is definitely a meta call. I mean, the fighting decks are fantastic against lightning decks. They're fantastic against the uh, Zoric decks as well. But against a deck like Vileplume, we see Brady just, you know, not messing around. He's just going to be able to Stevens resolve every single turn. Holden might not even play a card that allows uh, him to shuffle Brady's hand back into the deck. So he might not even be... He's got the Baby Buzz in the active, but the Baby Buzz can't attack either. He also just he's going to have to pass. Yeah, the Baby Buzz ain't doing nothing. So uh, you know, Holden is GX'd and everything. I think he is just uh, signaling that he's just helpless. Out here on stream, you know, up a river without a paddle, just in this uh, boat that is most definitely sinking. He's going to Cynthia here, and it's just, uh, it just feels bad, right? So the Vileplume deck is going to be able to win this game uh, because it plays Unknown Hand. So he's going to just sit there and Steven's Resolve a million times until he gets the unknown hand into his hand. So, yeah, pretty cutthroat out here, but we see that uh, these guys are not necessarily playing for entertainment tonight. Brady is looking for championship points. He's, like, en route, trying to get a world's invite. So he's just going to play whatever deck he thinks gives him the best chance of winning games. And honestly, at a league challenge, a lot of times players are not expecting the Vileplume stall deck, right? So Holden unfortunately did not take Vileplume stall into consideration when constructing his deck and I can't necessarily blame him there's not exactly a lot of uh, it's not exactly a lot of Vileplume stall here uh, typically so yeah this game is going to be an absolute wash it's just just a tough match for sure but fortunately Holden you know he's just kind of goofing around having fun I don't think he really minds too much uh, he seems to be Doing some pretty funny game actions here, loading up his buzz walls, right, and doing goofy things like GXing because he doesn't really he doesn't really mind. He knows that he doesn't have an out the win. He knows what it is. So, looks like uh, Holden actually has copycat in his hand, so he's going to be able to copycat and get a gigantic hand here. He might be trying to deck himself out, which could be a pretty epic finale to this. Uh, what would otherwise just be, you know, definitely a snooze fest. But Holden's just passing here doesn't have it right now. Brady's going to lose a mean here. Gets Porter back into his hand and pass. And Holden, playing another escape rope. That is it. And at this point, we have to know there is a... Yeah, there's no sort of uh, anticipation. There's no sort of, uh, you know, uh, can Holden win this match? We know Holden cannot win this match. There is no answer in Holden's deck for this. So unfortunately, we just got Brady sitting here playing solitaire with himself, using Steven's Resolve, and we've gotten to the end point of this game where Brady is just using Steven's Resolve and literally drawing three cards off the top of his deck because it does not matter what those three cards are. He is just trying to get to 35 cards so that he can unknown hand. So that's what that is going to be. And he'll probably just keep looping Steven's Resolve here. We see him just taking three cards off the deck. He doesn't care what they are. And then he'll probably lose a mean for the Stevens resolve back. And then he's going to continue doing it while Holden sits here with a bunch of loaded buzzwells that cannot do anything. Right. Benjamin Lee, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm actually running out of stuff to talk about. I was actually going to come in here and see if you actually still have stuff to talk about. Because I was watching <laughs> that game and I was like, uh, you know, I think Brady has like, you know, he's up to like 24 cards or something now in his hand. Uh, he did talk about, he was thinking about Lu Yang, the buzzball, just for fun. Just for fun, yeah. right. No, I think Brady should uh, c 
cut us all a break and win this oh, game Colton as quickly as possible. Got it out. Colton was very excited about that copycat. You're right, because he's a copycat for like 24. Yeah. <laughs> Colton might be able to deck himself before Brady gets the unknown. Exactly. So this is uh yeah, this is going to be a huge draw here. I think he's drawn out his oh. whole head. And that's it. What an epic finale. Holden saying, you know what? I'm not going to take this. I'm going to deck myself out. All right? I you, admire it. Yeah, I admire it too. Holden has no answer for those Violet Plumes. Brady got two Violet Plumes out super quickly. There was nothing Holden could do. Wow. So that's it. Round four. Can we move it on to the fifth and final round here shortly? Ooh. Stahl moving on to 3 0 oh, 1. All right, Brady. I hope you washed your hands after that match. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was dirty. Yeah. yeah. All right. So talk to me about it. Uh, well, I knew he was playing the like Grant Buzzle deck that only plays Buzzles, no Lycan Rocks. So I figured I'd just get out some Vile Plumes and you can't do anything. And it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> got out two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we saw we got to that uh, the kind of end state with the Vile Plume deck where you're literally just Steven Zing for your top three cards. Because yeah. you yeah. don't just care what get the Get three cards in your hand as fast as you can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're just going to Steven draw three, pass, you know. Uh, and it looks like uh, Holden was kind of having fun there, uh, goofing yeah, around. Yeah. He didn't really mind too much. But you can imagine at a regional championship, <laughs> uh, moods will sour yeah. when they are faced with a deck <laughs> like that, for sure. Yeah. And I heard it firsthand from Otto and Riley that, yeah, some of their opponents are very salty mm-hmm. uh-huh. yeah, facing, <laughs> uh, facing a deck like that because uh, it's just uh, it's kind of a... Uh, it's an alternative win condition that gets exploited there that we don't often see decks prepare for. Yeah, and it's definitely just like not fun to not attack the entire game and just like sit no. there and draw and do nothing. It's not fun because it's like yeah. you know against half the decks in the meta, they, the vile plume you just get it out and it's just I have to concede now. Right. So really tough. And then like in order to account for the vile plume, you got to muddy up your deck with all this other stuff that you might not want it to play. Mm-hmm. Like I was saying, hopefully Holden plays a Lycan Rock. Didn't play like that. Yeah. No, just buzzwalls. So really, uh, really tough stuff there for the fighting deck. But hey, you're looking like you're probably cruising towards some championship points today. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I have to win to get championship points. But, so. it, but at what cost? <laughs> right. <laughs> at what cost? Yeah. Have you soiled your name here on the uh, stream? Yeah. <laughs> Brady, <laughs> Brady hot hands. More like Brady washes hands. <laughs> am I right? <laughs> Just kidding, Brady. It's a valid <laughs> strategy, obviously, but we could see that it is, uh, there's that, uh, uh, the issue of, like, how do I make this exciting? Right. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I actually, I do my best as a commentator to, like, kind of stay in the game and uh, make it viewer-friendly, but stall is just, no matter which way you cut it, stall is, like, not viewer-friendly. Yeah. But I think it's, like, it's kind of important uh, to exist in the game. I don't know if you agree with me there. Do you think? Yeah, I think that it's good for there to be like alternate ways to win the game. If, yeah. If like every if every deck is just like a big dude who swings for a lot of damage, and like the only difference is the, like color on the card, then like it. So I don't know. The game could get kind of stale. There needs to right. be like some sort of. Uh, I don't know. Different I like that play. there's alternative win conditions, and I think stall decks just uh, they kind of keep the format in check. You need to play enough resources to deal right. with these decks. Yeah. You need to play enough recovery to deal with these decks. Right. You need to play a deck that is versatile enough to deal with this deck and not mm-hmm. exploitable. So it's like cards like Hoopa, cards like Regigigas, right? Like, you're going to have to play non-GX attackers in your deck. But I just want to play three Picaron. <laughs> right. No, you're going to have to put some other guys in your right. deck, too. I don't want to play Jolteon. <laughs> Well, you're going to have to make room for Jolteon, too, right? So there are answers to the deck. It's just that a lot of time deck builders will get greedy and not play them. Right. So I played against uh, Picaron with Jolteon, and he had one card hand, and I played Mars to get rid of it, and it was the Jolteon. He didn't play Rescue Stretcher. <laughs> <laughs> got him. Oh, got him. Right. So uh, I think that... Yes, it is important for these stall decks to exist because they keep other decks in check. I think my major hope is that other decks just actually rise to the occasion and hate the stall decks out of the format. Yeah. that Because uh, it makes the game more exciting to watch. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But uh, I know this isn't your, uh, this is Evil Brady. We got yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are featuring Evil Brady Botner. Yeah. 
uh, Brady Balder in the most, uh, the worst timeline <laughs> where he loves stall decks and watching his opponents just, you know, curl up into the fetal position and cry. Yeah. So, good stuff, Brady. Hey, good luck in your last round. And Thank you. Take it easy. Yep. Gearing up for the fifth and final round of the Fulgur Games League Challenge, we've got Otto Belendran on the right versus Jesse Parker on the left. Should be an exciting finale to these to this large league challenge. We got 21 Masters players in five rounds here on this Wednesday evening. Looks like Otto is. I'm not sure what Otto is playing. And it looks like he might be playing a Zorark deck. And sure enough, that is. He's got probably Zorark control. If I had to guess on his side of the field, and Jesse is playing Blacephalon GX. I think that Blacephalon should be pretty heavily favored in this matchup. The Zora control deck does not even play any choice bands from what I remember. I think that it is just aiming to tank hits with bodybuilding dumbbells and then remove energy from the opponent's side of the field. If Jesse can play his cards right, he should be able to lean on the energy switches in his deck to pull off gigantic mind-blown attacks, hitting for upwards of 250 damage. In fact, that the math on the bodybuilding dumbbells does not matter to Blacephalon at all. Blacephalon hits in, in increments of 50 damage, meaning that it needs to loss zone five fire energies to hit 250, and the difference between 210 and 250 is nothing for a Blacephalon deck. So Jesse should be just fine here while Otto is going to be hoping to hit as many crushing hammerheads as he can to keep Jesse dry of energy while he eventually tries to take control over the board. I don't think Otto is going to want to take any prizes in this matchup. He's probably going to try and win by energy denial and then potentially deck out, which is a theme we've been seeing a lot of tonight. And it looks like Otto is on the draw. He's going to be going first. So... The Zora control deck is at its worst when it unlocks the Beast Ring turn for Blacephalon. So that's something that Otto is probably going to be trying to avoid here. If he gives Jesse even just one turn of Beast Ring, Jesse is going to be able to tee off and just load the field with fire energy and create gigantic, gigantic mind blown turns. All right, looks like Otto is going for Mysterious Treasure for Lele, and he's going to Wonder Tag, grabbing that Lily out of the deck, and it's going to get a big turn one draw here with Lily. And we'll see how Otto sets up his board. Jesse placing the Grimer down on the bench, I think could be a big mistake in this matchup. Otto has got to be excited about that Grimer on his bench as a potential target to strand in the active position. The Grimer has got a fat retreat cost of three and will be difficult for Jesse to retreat or switch out of throughout the course of the game. Otto is going to be looking to drag that Grimer up into the active position over and over again. While Jesse may end up having to pay the price for that, we will definitely have to see. I think if played correctly, Otto should be able to use that Grimer as his primary win condition in this game. Jesse probably only plays three copies of Guzma and no other switch cards. So with only three copies of Guzma in deck, he only has three opportunities to move that Grimer from the active position once it finds its way there. And that could be a big downfall for Jesse's deck. Looks like Jesse's going to start off with an Ultra Space going in and searching out his deck for an Ultra Beast Pokemon. He will probably be grabbing Poipole just to start to establish his board and get a Pokemon that can evolve into Naginadel, which can accelerate energy from the discard pile into play. Sure enough, he grabs the Poipole there out of his deck. So. Good start so far, and it looks like he does have an Ultra Ball and an Erica's Hospitality in his deck. Erica's Hospitality is actually not a bad play at all for Jesse since Otto does have four Pokemon in play, so Jesse can safely Ultra Ball for another Poiple and then use Erica's Hospitality to draw four cards, hoping that he finds another Fire Energy. We do see Jesse opting to discard a Fire Energy there off of the Ultra Ball, and I don't think that's bad. 
but he definitely wants to find another fire energy off the Erica so that he can get a turn one attachment to the active Blacephalon GX and get ready for a turn two or maybe turn three mind blown. I think that Jesse would like to get a turn one burst GX here. Just start off the game by taking a prize and potentially accelerating an energy as well. Oh, I didn't see that Lily hiding in the deck. This is going to be much better than the Erica's. The Lily is a fantastic option. Jesse's going to be able to draw seven, and it looks like half of those are fire energy, which is insane. Jesse's got a fat hand filled with just fire energy, right? So one of those will definitely make its way onto Placephalon, and he's going to have a burst GX, and it looks like Jesse may actually be able to play his hand down a couple cards this next turn in order to Erica's afterwards, so it's not bad. Should probably be fine here. But I do expect to see a burst GX here. And sure enough, we get it, and it's a Placephalon. That's the second Placephalon down, so definitely important to note, Jesse probably only has one Blacephalon GX left in the deck, meaning that he's only going to have two throughout the course of the game, which could be bad, folks. That could be bad. A lot of times you do need that third Blacephalon GX to finish up the game. It's the only real attacker in the deck. Otto's going to evolve his benched Zerua into Zorark and then trade away a Pokecom for his first trade. Go for Crushing Hammer. It's Tails. That is a bummer. Definitely wants to get that fire energy off of the Blacephalon. And then looks like Otto has DC on the bench. Zorak, he might have a Guzma in his hand to take out a Poiple on the bench or Ditto Prism Star just to limit Jesse's options. Looks like Otto also has a second Zorark for the active as well, considering whether to go for a second trade here. And it actually looks like Otto's just going to wonder tech. Probably grab himself the Guzma, if I had to guess, since he committed that double colorless to the bench Zorark. I think that Guzma might have been his play all along that he was considering. Otherwise, I'm not sure why he would attach the energy to the benched Zorark here. But it looks like Otto's just going for a judge. So he's just trying to limit Jesse's hand after a big turn one Lily, which I think is totally fair. So... Looks like Otto checking his discard pile, making sure he's aware of the resources that he's used. And he'll go in either with a second trade. It looks like he's trade away the alone muck. Doesn't actually want the muck. That's fair. I think Otto probably just wants to establish his board with as many Zorks as he can. But maybe he does go for the muck. It's fine. If he goes for the muck, then that means that Jesse's not going to be able to let loose or evolve his own Ditto Prism Star. It looks like Otto's just going to bring up a Poiple and then probably evolve his own Ditto into muck. And that shuts down a lot of options for Jesse. He can't let loose. He can't evolve his Ditto Prism Star. He's only going to have the option to... Um, he's only going to have the option to evolve one Naginatal this next turn, which is tough. But I think that Jesse could still have a pretty decent turn this next turn. Though I think auto evolving the muck, knocking out the poipo means that Jesse is not going to be able to get a knockout on the Zorak guaranteed next turn. So he's going to have to Bursting Burn. That's just a guarantee. We already know that. And then I don't actually think that Otto has the cards in his hand to be, or Jesse has the cards in his hand to be able to pair his hand out. So Jesse takes a look at Otto's hand with Lavender Town and proceeds forward with his turn. He's going to attach Energy Switch. I really hate to see uh, an Energy Switch get used this early since we know how important the Energy Switches are going to be for Jesse's strategy later in the game against this control deck it's trying to remove Jesse's energies from play. Now, it looks like Jesse does have the option to get a Naginatal out. He can pretty much just discard the Let Loose Marshadow. Yeah, he doesn't really care about it because that Alolan Muck is completely shutting down all of the basic Pokemon's abilities. So that's not really going to be an option for him. So he opts to just get another Poiple into play. I think that's fair. And then 
I know Jesse does have a lily in his hand, but I'm not exactly sure how strong his hand is otherwise. I know he's got at least probably a beast ring in that hand as well. Let's see if we can get a better look here at what resources he's working with. He actually has his own Alola Muck and a Naginato. So he is going to be able to charge up, get another energy into play. And I fully expect to see a Bursting Burn this turn to burn and confuse Otto's active Zorark. And I think that Otto should be able to take control of this game by bringing up Jesse's Muck and kind of forcing him to find all his switch cards while slowly using crushing hammers and resource management Oranguru to kind of get him out of the game. That at least would be my thought process. We see Otto go for a trade, trading away the second muck. The Zorark deck plays a lot of muck. It plays like a 2-2 muck line. Very thick. Otto going for another crushing hammer. This one would be big. And does not get it. So 0 for 2 on Crushing Hammers so far. And we see Otto checking Jesse's discard pile. And the Lavender Town, really interesting here, allowing both players to check each other's hands during their turn to kind of prepare their strategy forward. Looks like Otto done with both his trades and is considering an Ace Arola here. But first he wants to check Jesse's hand. And I think that that's smart. See what Jesse's working with. He's got a Marsh Shadow, a Lily, Beast Ring, and two Fire Energies. And it looks like Otto is just going to opt to Ace Arola up that Zorark. Probably go in with another Zorark. Now, this is a little bit risky for Otto. I think that Otto opens himself up to lose this game playing like this, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure that there's too much else he could do. I think... Otto should have Guzman up that Grimer a long time ago, to be honest, and just forced Jesse to find switch cards. But Otto is playing into exactly what Jesse wants to do right now. Jesse wants to play a game that is all about taking prizes, and Otto aggressing here and hitting into the Bluff Cephalon is doing exactly what Jesse wants him to do. All Jesse needs to do is get an energy into the discard pile this turn, charge up, attach. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, if he can get two more energy into play, he's going to be able to one-hit KO this Zorark and go down to three prizes remaining. And then even if Otto tries to stall Jesse out from there, Jesse can just Guzma twice for game. So I think Otto putting this Zorark in the active position gives Jesse a chance. But it actually looks like Jesse's going to take this opportunity to knock out a Zerua. I don't think it's a bad play. He's got a Lily and a Beast Ring in hand, and not a lot of other draw cards, so I think it's fine. But Jesse also has to tread carefully. He's only got two Blacephalons. Uh, if you guys remember, he's already discarded two. So I really want to see Jesse kind of hang tight here and not throw away his second to last Blacephalon. He does have, you know, an option to use this Beast Ring next turn, but it's going to be a tough route going forward. He has to loss zone two Fire Energies in order to knock out this Zerua. We'll see if Jesse is able to find his final Blacephalon, though I think at this point the discarding two Blacephalon could just be what does Jesse in here and allows Otto to skate away with this game that and the Alola Muck on the bench are really making me nervous here I'm just going to check Jesse's hand Jesse was able to find a Cynthia there so he's got a better draw supporter for next turn other than that Lily and it looks like Otto's just going to ultra ball his entire hand away and I wonder what he could be getting uh, just a Zerua okay um, and then we'll judge. Okay, he did have a judge left in his hand, so he's going to shuffle them both to four. Otto realizing that Jesse's hand is very strong, actually. So wanting to get rid of those resources is totally reasonable. Now, I'm concerned about Jesse's route to win the game. I think Jesse needs to get 
his final Blacephalon into play this next turn. And then he needs to Beast Ring at least three, like two or three times. That is really Jesse's only chance to win the game. And sure enough, he starts with an Ultra Ball and a Beast Ring. Uh, it's kind of exactly what he wants to see. Jesse will Ultra Ball away whatever his top deck is in that Fire Energy, get himself his final Blacephalon if it's in the deck, and then Beast Ring to it. It's a perfect start for Jesse here. Perfect start to what he wants to accomplish in this upcoming turn. And Otto is just going to give Jesse the Beast Ring. I think that that's another Tails on Crushing Hammer from Otto. Absolutely devastating. He's 0 for 3 so far. And Otto just playing Jesse's game, playing into the strategy here. I think that this opens up a window for Jesse to win the game now. Jesse sees the Heat Factory. He top decks the Heat Factory. That's like the worst card he could have possibly top decked. I think Jesse needs to play the Heat Factory down and trade that fire for three more cards. That's actually totally fine because he'll just use the Heat Factory, get three more cards into his hand. Then he can Ultra Ball those away. So he Ultra Ball away the Cynthia or the, the Lily and the Mysterious Treasure, get himself another Blacephalon. I really hope that he gets himself a Blacephalon here. I see him playing the Mysterious Treasure, but he desperately needs to get a Blacephalon to play that Beast Ring onto, or else he's not going to have a chance to win this game. That would be really devastating. We see him opting for the Cynthia. I thought the Cynthia was going to be his draw card of choice here. And he's taking a look at his deck. I wonder if his final Blacephalon is in there. I actually don't see it. His final Blacephalon might be prized, which would be absolutely devastating. I mean, that would just be clear-cut game for sure. Jesse needs to play his B-string. I'm not exactly sure why he's shuffling up here. Because he is probably going to end up using B-string, if I imagine. This, uh this upcoming play. Oh, he's going to Lily first. Okay. Interesting. Now, I'm not sure why he opted to do his turn that way. I think it's a little wonky. Uh, he's got everything that he needs now, but I would have liked to see Jesse get maybe a second uh, just maybe get a bigger draw with the Cynthia. Instead of just lilying for a couple. We'll see if his final Blacephalon's in the deck. I mean, I imagine... There it is. Okay. Fourth Blacephalon, and he's got B-String. So he can accelerate with that. And... Then uh, he's going to be able to attach for turn as well. So he's got a potential couple charge-ups too. So he's going to be taking this knockout here, dealing 250 damage. And then he's just got a Guzma for game. Otto's really hoping that, or Jesse's really hoping that Otto does not counter this Heat Factory. Because I think the Heat Factory is what's going to keep uh, what's going to keep him in the game. Yeah, Dispenser, I'm with you on that one. But, you know, sometimes you get in the thick of the play and you don't necessarily see your route. It's all good. Jesse's got the mind blown here for 250 damage. He has to remove all but one. Puts himself in a very compromising situation, only getting the one B string off because if Otto hits a crushing hammer, he could just keep Jesse out of this game. Also, if he hits a counter stadium, he could keep Jesse out of this game. There's a bunch of ways Otto can do that. So it's really stressful for Otto right now. Otto also has no clue what's in Jesse's hand. That Lavender Town no longer in play. And I think we've seen two Lavender Towns from Otto. He's going to go for his fourth and final Crushing Hammer here. And it's, it's another one. Unbelievable, Otto. Unbelievable. He's going to evolve into Zorark. And he's got one trade. Otto could just be out of options here. And I think after this game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a talk with Otto, man. 
think he needed to go about this matchup completely differently. But still a tough matchup, I'll give him that. It's definitely not easy. The ability to one-hit KO these Zoraks, even through the bodybuilding dumbbells, is really stressful and really puts the deck on a clock. There's just not a lot of turns to work with here to execute the, the control aspect of this game, especially when you're 0 for 4 on crushing hammers. Certainly any of these crushing hammers would have helped Otto to secure up the game. But I'm not even sure Otto has a double colorless to attack this turn. Otto is committed to attacking this game. I think that there is a route where he can kind of control Jesse out of the game. But locking himself into attacking, you know that you're going to lose this game because Zorix two-hit KO Blacephalons, and Blacephalons can one-hit KO Zorix. So really tough stuff. I just got a Lily here for three. Finds a double colorless energy, so he is going to be able to ride his beating this turn. And he counters the Heat Factory. That is huge with Champions Festival. And Otto hits into this Blacephalon for some damage. Sure enough, Jesse, what a guy. Top deck Cynthia, just in time. Unbelievable. All Jesse needs is a beast ring, just a beast ring, and he'll be able to win this game. Otto's still on three prizes remaining. I can't believe it. Jesse with the top deck of a century there, getting himself, getting himself out of that one. He just needs to find himself one B string. That's it. But all he gets is the six cards. He can't let loose. None of that is an option. He just gets to draw six and hope that he hits a B string. But Cynthia was the best draw supporter he could have possibly seen there. And we'll see. Erica's Lily. Energy switch. There it is. There's a B string and a fire. And that should be it. He's got the B string. And then can accelerate from the discard pile to one of his bench nag and eight L's, and that's 250 damage for game. And Jesse takes it, mind blown, 250 damage. Auto goes down with the Zora control deck, and Jesse will emerge victorious with his Blacephalon deck in the fifth and final round of the Full Grip Games League Challenge. Andrew Barlow taking it down with, what deck did you play? Vika Ray. Vika Ray, all right, was it uh, Jose's? Jose's? Yes. All right, Jose's list, how'd you like it? It, it ran fairly well. It was working a lot more than Bulu I brought back a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, Vigor is better than Bulu. Yeah. Yeah, Tempest GX really good. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in the meta that we saw here on stream tonight, Stall decks, yep. Zoro control, Vigor actually just has a field day. Yes, it does. That's perfect matchups. I mean, how do you feel about playing against Stall with Vigor that it's just the easiest matchup because it's <laughs> because you have you're able to build up enough damage because they usually don't have enough energy discard to deal with you. Right. And then with the Zero Aura for free retreat, you can't really get locked active. You have Shaman Prism Star to Anna Delmise to hit Hoopas. Hoopas. Easy. And then you and then when you play like Brady's deck who had the Vile Plume, you have the Vika Volt just to one shot. No problem. And then he, he was just, that was like the, he, I played him last round and yeah. he just was not, it was, it was not fun just because ugly. he has nothing he can do. Nothing. He can plumeria off an energy, but. One energy. And then you just stop. Yeah. And then if he puts Lugia out, you're just going to destroy it. Yep. So just uh, absolutely a great meta call for a field of control decks. Vika Ray floods mm -hmm. the field with energy like no other deck does. So awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. How many championship points are you out now, Barlow? Uh, 190. 190, all right. So cruising along there. I know you've been uh, killing it at these full group games tournaments here. I know. Okay, excellent yeah. stuff, man. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah. you know, you know what uh, what you're saving up for with that store credit? Anything in particular? Probably get some Restoration Charizards from the next set. Yeah, we're going to have those on pre-sale here within the mm -hmm. next 24 hours, so really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Restoration Charizard. So what do you think about Restoration Charizard coming out of the next set? It, it looks like it has, with the welder, just yeah. to power it up in basically one turn. Yeah. 230 is just going to be hit raw, a lot of numbers, and 260 with the choice ban. Yeah. There's nothing much outs that can withstand it outside of, I think, Waylord. 
Yeah, that's it. I mean, even Venusaur gets smoked by it. You mm-hmm. know, Mel Metal, if that was ever going to be a thing, can't be a thing because Fry of it. <laughs> Frying <laughs> Fry Fry pan, no cap, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, awesome stuff, Barlow. Well, congrats on the win, man. All right, thank and, you. And, uh, yeah, keep it rocking, dude. We'll see you uh, next week. Yep. Hey, we got Jesse Parker here. Hey. Otto's here, too, but he's, hey, he's, he's right over there. Ooh, All right, so we were talking about your game. Uh, just to be honest, Otto, I think you royally messed that one up. Yeah. Oh. What yeah. Did I do? You should have brought up the muck, bro. It's just like that should you shouldn't have never played into V string and just tried to bring up the muck. Oh, and just trap them there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I think like obviously that's what you do in a real game. Is it's like, like I've I've watched a bunch of hours of Zora Control and uh-huh. like I've talked to the DDG guys a whole bunch. Uh huh. Yeah, I can. Sc- yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think you can win if you're actually just trying to like trade six prizes for six prizes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you can. I did beat a Bocephalon in Swiss, and so there's like two ways to win: is you you soften all the Bocephalons. Sure. You hit 120 on all of them without yeah. activating V string. Yeah. And then you go for knockouts. Yeah. But that is easiest if you hit any heads on your crushing hammers. Oh, for sure. But like so, that was not working out. Right. So because <laughs> I was hitting tails on them, so I decided that I just needed to kill one Bocephalon, because I knew I was going to be able to soak one hit, yeah. and then all I needed was to, like, Guzma KO a ditto yeah. on that turn that I whacked him for 120. Yeah. And then it would have been fine. There was you a lot of been. things that yeah. could have right. made that yeah. game a lot or, more or awkward if, for me. If that turn before I passed to him, if I had gotten the heads on that hammer, then he would have been one energy short to, to mind-blown me there, too. And then the, any of the three crushing hammers before that, I'm, I'm not saying it's, like, <laughs> the easiest way... No, you're the right. Best, you're the right. smartest way to play it is what, like, Azul said to do is to, like, basically... Like you said, trap up the muck, bring up a Rangru, and just shuffle and crush hammers. I think you almost don't oh, lose yeah. if you just do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you do, though. No, he's only got three Guzma in deck. Yeah, that thing's got a three retreat cost. He ain't never four. getting out the active. Four retreat. The muck is a four. The Grimer, if you oh, kept yeah. the Grimer, three. is three. Yeah, yes. I don't know. I I get sacked a lot, so I just assume they're just going to have the, the Guzmas. <laughs> three Guzmas. He would have had to find all three Guzmas. I don't think I had it either. I didn't. I guess I don't remember, but I don't think I did. Mm. But yeah. I don't know. Whatever. So it's all, it's all good. I mean, yeah, you would have yeah. had to go with that strategy from, like, turn one. Right, right. Like, seeing right, him start yeah. the Grimer and just been like, that's what I'm going mm-hmm, for, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, he, uh, there was so many things that could have went wrong for me, obviously, like him hitting heads on the oh, on those. Oh, for but sure. Also, uh, my hand was dead after I got that big knockout, the second knockout, uh, and he bumped my heat factory. So I, Top and then I. Cynthia. Top Tech Cynthia. I saw it. That was <laughs> no, great. I was, was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think Otto still got this one, you know? <laughs> Unless he top decks. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that, that was insane, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 it's not a strategy I would actually go for normally. Yeah. But yeah. the game, the way the game played out, I was like, oh, I've, like, got the early Guzma on the Poi pole. And if right. you, and like, then he, the mug then, early. Right. If I had because missed I got, a draw supporter, you would have just won. Right. You would have just well, won. I mean, even besides that, even besides I just that. figured way the board state looks. Like, sometimes I feel like you have to read the board right. state. Right, no, you're right. It's like, okay, I have Guzma. I can knock out a Poi pole. There's no way he can get a KO the next turn. And then I knew there was no way you get a KO in the turn after that because I have going to have dumbbells and you have to hit 250. Right. So then I was like, okay, I'm at least good for two turns. You I can't always play around. You can't always play like like they have Guzma. I mean, sometimes you have to play like they have Guzma at yeah. all times. It's, it's a risky so, way to go, I think. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I mean, does the deck play counter catchers? No. 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 Okay. Yeah. There's, I was only, the there's only two maybe. Guzma, too. So it's okay. like, you mm-hmm. have to bring them back. You have to hit your own Guzma to bring them back up active. Right. It's That's like fair. not easy to, to do that. It's like I've played stall where it's like easier to like trap something active with your own lone active so they have to forcibly retreat it. Yeah, yeah. But like in this deck you have bench sitters and I had already put down Lele and stuff like that. That makes sense. I was that like, makes there's sense. no kind way. Of like once you had, control once you had committed to attacking, you were out of the stall. Yeah, you, yeah. You could exactly. not do right, it. Right. Yeah. And like that was uh, never happening. Mm-hmm. And then so you were then you were just leaning on the hammers and just hoping mm-hmm. one of them buffed out. Right, right. There's a coin flip card, you know. Yeah. I think crushing hammer is a horrible card. I cut it from uh, Wacky Smacky. I know play, you guys so. all did, yeah. So. Yeah. So mm-hmm. for yeah. acro bikes. But anyways, Blasphemon getting in there. Yeah. Hey, you know, as it do. Yep. Does excellent stuff. Does that sometimes? You yeah. Know. Sometimes it sure. does that four games in a row. You know. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes it'll do it 16 games in a row. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, regional. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, excellent stuff, guys. You guys uh, definitely made for a fun and engaging game. It was uh, yeah, not bad. fun to commentate over, so thank you for that. And uh, you. congrats on your top fours this week. Oh, thank you. Excellent Appreciate stuff. It. All right, cool. take it easy. All right, y'all. 
that is it. Mr. Squeezel says Otto is so cool, by the way, Otto. Yeah, I love you, Mr. Says, yeah, Otto says he loves you, Mr. Squeezel. All right. Thank you guys all for watching the stream. You made it an incredible night for me. It was awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, Full Grip Games is going to be doing pre-orders for uh, the Unbroken Bonds singles. Within the next 24 hours, you can check fullgrifgames.com. They're going to be up soon. Not now, but soon. We do have pre-orders for uh, Unbroken Bonds booster boxes up now, though, if you're interested in that. And also, of course, you can always trade in your unwanted Pokemon bulk for booster boxes uh, on fullgrifgames.com as well. So make sure to check that out and do that. It was uh, an awesome time. Congrats to Andrew Barlow for winning another league challenge here at the grip and thank you all for your viewership for the subs for the bits and for all the follows that i saw ticking in you may have seen the other day we topped 3,000 followers 3,030 followers now so really stoked on that also i know alaskan hero 24 hours such a long range of time that i'm basically telling you it's going to be done probably by i would say probably by like 5 p.m tomorrow they will be up that's my estimate, okay? They could even be up like later tonight, but I think that they'll probably be up by like 5 p.m. tomorrow. That gives us enough time to go home, wake up. It's literally me and Sean working on it. It's me and Sean. It's not a big operation. It's 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 us too, okay? So I need to like, you know, brainstorm with Sean. We need to sit down. We need me and Sean are gonna cook up the prices for the pre pre-orders and then and then they're gonna be live. So like, you know, full disclosure, this is what's happening. They'll be up within the next uh, within the next day by tomorrow they'll be up by tomorrow so thank you guys all for the awesome stream we're gonna raid Riley all right we're gonna raid Munner so get your raid hats on and ready geared up ready to go all right let's raid Munner all right and uh, volcanic tiger it was Vika Ray that won we're gonna raid Riley you guys all have a great night tag team make sure to give tag team your most awesome viewership tonight's and uh, they do a great job of that. So let's get the full grip squad over there. We got 41 viewers, 42. Can we get 40, 42? Awesome. All right, take it easy. Peace, guys.